I heard you had lunch with the best view in the city. <laughs> That's wonderful. I did take a picture of that when I was there last, last night. Got to go out on the deck. It's wonderful to be here. And may, I met some of you last night. Who are the students here? OK, so the deal is with the bosses are in the room because you're who we work for. And when I say that at the department, the bosses are in the room. People look around for Secretary Cardona because he's the Secretary of Education. He's the boss. But we're looking at the students because we're clear on who we work for. And everything that we do, all the decisions that we make, all the important decisions, policy decisions, finance decisions, everything we do is to put students at the center of it. So I always want to recognize the students at the center of everything we do. And you're here in the room. So hoping you're learning a lot and having a chance to meet lots of people and learn how we do the work here. And so thank you also to the entire team here at the Reagan Institute. Who are the staff here at Reagan Institute? I want to give them a round of applause. Where are they? And to the tech team, I have this practice where I start every day with gratitude, end every day with gratitude. And now I've just learned to just do gratitude all throughout the day <laughs> because it's just a really great way of living in the world. And so I have a lot of gratitude when we do a big event like this. The staff that put something like this together, these things are not easy to do. The kinds of people that, that have to be a part of it, the tech staff and the streaming and everything that happens, I think it's really important. So um, I enjoyed meeting many of you last night. And for Governor Wise, I brought you a little something today because. Yeah. I was going to go to Amazon. <laughs> no, this is not the book that I wrote, but this is a book called The Art of Writing and Speaking the English Language. It was written in 1903, and it tells about the science of reading that you and I discussed yesterday. So I brought this for you to see, and anybody else that's interested, an old favorite John Dewey experience in education, because we're talking about we can look back, we can look to today, and we can look forward. And so many answers are so clear. And the ability to be able to move forward and give children what they need, when they need it, in the way that they need it, learning from our history and understanding this present moment matters. But an event like this, putting an event at, uh, of this magnitude and this scale together does take a lot of work. So I do applaud you and everybody at this institute who made this happen, and everybody online as well putting this all together, you are doing what's necessary to create our next generation of leaders. And when I look to the students that are in this room and I think about what you're going to be doing to be our next generation of leaders, we just want to make sure we're getting it right for you and we're doing things that you need. So you are the true bosses. You are the ones that are going to change the world. And our goal is, what is it that we're here to create? This is my 34th year in education. I was a teacher for many years, 17 years in the classroom. I taught kindergarten. I always say, if you teach kindergarten, you can pretty much do anything. I did that. I taught mostly elementary school. And if you think about what are we up to, the work that we're trying to do is to create the conditions in every single classroom, every single day, for every single learner, no matter where they are, no matter their background, no matter their experiences, create exquisite learning conditions so that children can become actively literate, contributing, participating members of a democratic society who make a positive difference in the world. That's the big idea. How do we do that? How can we create those conditions every day for every child? Not for some children, some days, in some places, but for every day. And to have that idea about becoming somebody who's a change maker and a change agent and creating conditions in classrooms that allow that to happen, to unlock the genius of each and every learner in every single con learning condition that we can create for them. That's the big idea. And so everyone's trying to figure out how do you do it. Have a think tank, look at data, figure it out, get the answers, have the next new product. But what's possible, how do we actually create those conditions? And I want to say the answer is at once very simple, while at the same time being incredibly complex. Because if this were easy to do, if we actually knew how to do it, would it already be done? Well, it is being done in some places because it's so complex. And what I know from my 34 years of experience, and it's a great honor to be serving in the role that I'm serving now, and I bring the 34 years of experience to this role. When people meet me and they don't know the fancy title that Roger was so kind to introduce me with my current role, they ask me what I do. You know, you meet a stranger on a plane, oh, what do you do? I work here, I work here. I say I'm a teacher. That's, that's who I am. That's what I do. I have a different job title right now. But I've always been very clear on, number one, who I work for, and number one, what my work is, even though my job has changed from a teacher to a vice principal to a principal to most recently before coming here, superintendent of San Diego Unified School District, where we had 100,000 students and 
16,000 staff members and a $1.2 billion budget, that was a job I had. But the work is always the same work, is creating the exquisite learning conditions that work for students. And the only way that I know that that works every single time, whether it was when I was a classroom teacher or a building literacy specialist or vice principal, principal superintendent, is to do the work in community. You cannot help people. You cannot make the kind of change. You can't help people that you don't care about. You can't help people who you don't know and you're not in meaningful and authentic relationship with. Where is the heartbeat and when does the heartbeat happen? When are you tapped into the heartbeat of a community and figuring out what that community cares most about and creating change like that? For me, I have never believed that your demography determines your destiny. I have always believed in the hope and the promise of education. I've always made my decisions from whatever job I've happened to have from a place of understanding the needs of a student, understanding what's necessary. What does this student need and this student need and this student need? The answers never come from outside. The answers come from the local people that are doing the work. I say, you want to know what works? Ask the people doing the work. One of my favorite quotes is from a children's book called The Little Prince. Anybody familiar with that book? It's a beautiful book. I actually read it in, when I was in high school. I read it in French first when I took French. And the quote is, it's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. This is what good teachers and good principals know. We know how to look at things, sometimes the things that are easy to see. You can see what's broken. You can see what needs to be fixed. You can see the deficits. You can see the challenges and the struggles that students might have. But when you can see the strengths, gifts, talents, and ability, and when you know your students by name, strength, and need, and you create the learning conditions that allow students to get what they need, you see what's essential, and you build from there. And so that means you have to know your community, and you have to know your students. And it helps us as educators to see clearly and have long-term solutions when we make our decisions from the individual needs of a student. That's what good teachers do. So this happened to me very, very early in my career. When I was a teacher, I was a literacy specialist at a school that was in a district that for many years, it was a very high performing district, but there was a school where I was a teacher that was the lowest performing school in that district for many, many years. And it was expected, accepted, known by the district to be, well, you know, that's what you expect, that school, they're low performing, you know why. Why is it low performing? Oh, you know, they have Section 8 housing across the street. That's why, you know, they're doing the best they can with those kids that come from Section 8 housing. And so 50% of the population at that school was low income, Section 8 housing. 50% lived in houses up on the hill behind the school. And it was just the norm that it's okay, do the best you can. The kids that come from the apartments, make sure they get a turkey at Thanksgiving and do clothing donations for them. And we started thinking, wait, how about make sure we teach them? How about make sure we give them what they need? How about we make sure that they, I taught kindergarten there. 50% of the kids came in my classroom and they had parents that read to them since the first day of school. They had parents that had the home dripping in literacy, crayons and books and literacy all over the place, put baby Einstein on mommy's belly when they were pregnant. And then I had kids that came into my kindergarten class that did not have access to books and literacy. So what do you do? You teach them. And so what would happen at that school, and it took us about eight years to change the learning conditions in the school where every teacher learned and got what they needed to teach students how to become literate, to teach students to read, and when they came from different backgrounds and different experiences. And so after a while, we were able to get all students reading at grade level by the end of the school year. And then what happened is they would go home for the summer, and the kids that went to the Section 8 housing, they would lose reading levels over the summer. And the kids that went to camps and they had family literacy things at home, they maintained their reading levels. So it was a problem that I noticed as a literacy specialist, a teacher at the school, and I wanted to solve it. This is what I mean by local, the solutions come locally when a community discovers what it cares about. So I marched across the street and found the apartment manager and I said, do you have any vacant apartments over here? And he said, yeah, why? And I said, well, could you donate an apartment to the school for the summer so I can open up a summer literacy center. Because I thought if the kid, we taught the kids how to read during the school year, but to love to read and maintain their reading and come back not losing reading levels, they needed to read during the summer. And so they 
donated an apartment. We got an apartment, and then I thought, oh my gosh, now I have to fill this with books, and now I have to figure out how to teach, how to have reading go all summer long. So I wrote a letter. First time I ever wrote a letter to somebody elected, I didn't even know who the city council was at the time, but I looked up city council, I looked up a city council member for the area, and I wrote this passionate email to him, and I said, I want to open up a literacy center, I want to help the students read throughout the summer, I want them to maintain their reading level and learn and have a love of reading. And the city council member gave us $10,000 to open up. I said, I'll work for free. I will work all summer long. I will staff it. I don't need staff. I just want our kids to be reading all summer. And that's what we did. And I brought a picture. When we opened up, it was called Canyon Room Literacy Center. And these are three of the boys, um, Daquan and Darnell and Antoine. And these are three kids that when I was opening up the literacy center, I would drive my car through the apartment complex. And I would pick up kids, say, hey, let's go over at the time. I think it was Borders Books. Want to go to the bookstore with me? Sure, Mrs. I had probably had popsicles too or something. Like, let's go. So I gave him a hundred dollar gift card. We went to the bookstore and I picked these three boys first because these three boys like ran that apartment complex. It was basketball. They were outside to get kids to come off the basketball court and come inside and read in the summer. I had to have a little hook. Well, these kids dominated the basketball court. And when they told their friends that they bought books about basketball with Mrs. Martin and they were in the literacy center reading about being a better basketball player, all the kids wanted to come in because they wanted to learn to play basketball like these kids. So, and then uh, different kids went and picked the books that they wanted. But that's how you create a solution. And then those kids came back and we were able to look at their data. We were able to look at did they maintain their reading levels over the summer. And in fact, they did. And that literacy center continued after after I left there, I don't think it's still there anymore because this was about 20 years ago. But this is a moment that we're in right now. Communities, to set, this was one teacher coming up with a local solution for a local school and partnering across the city to make something like that happen. How does that happen? Can that happen across the country? Can that happen in every single community? I absolutely believe that it can. And it's because of gatherings like this, it's because of your networks and your belief in what actually happens. Here's the deal. We know how to do this. I have not met a student that we don't know how to teach, how to read and write and do math and be actively literate, contributing, participating members of society, but it never happens alone. And it's this intersection of academics with strong mentorship and community partnerships that allow us to create the skill sets and the knowledge and passion and unlock the genius of each and every student so that they can take on the challenges and become the future leaders like the ones I have sitting in this room right here. This is having a true North Star, having a compass and knowing what our journey is and knowing how to not be deviating from solutions that are coming from outside. And I think as now I step into this new role as Deputy Secretary to bring all of those years of experience into this role and think about some key principles and practices that will help us as we recover from the most difficult time in the history of education, in my opinion, how do we recover? How do we accelerate learning? How do we make up for some things that have happened? And we're going to start with the first principle is making sure we're providing equitable educational learning experience for every student. I've defined equity. I've already said it. Secretary Cardona and I are committed to equity. People can talk about it all day long. But what it means is each and every student gets what they need, when they need it, in the way that they need it. And I've added where they need it because where learning has taken place over the last two years has changed significantly. So place does matter, and kids can learn in different learning environments. So it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. When we're creating those conditions where students have their needs met and the needs of teachers also need to be met, for educators to have the supports and the training and the professional development that they need, every teacher wants to help a student succeed. But if they don't have the resources that they need, they can't go any, they can't do as much as their heart desires. Teachers need the financial security. They need to, that's why we've made changes. Secretary Cardona is committed to the changes in the public service loan forgiveness program. And those changes have allowed for public servants, including educators all over the country, to become free from student loan debt. So when I talk about equity, getting what you need, when you need it, and the way that you need it, it's for our educators that are teaching our students, and it's for our students, and being able to do this long term so it's a profession people can commit to. Second principle is a principle about whole child. In every, 
environment that I've worked in, a whole child approach where students are seen, heard, and valued, and their social, emotional, mental health, academic, intellectual needs are all met in a holistic way, both in the classroom and out of the classroom with community supports, working in partnership with you. That's the only way that it can happen. Teachers are not just subject matter experts. Teachers know the whole child and you build programs like I did at the school and that was 100% poverty and 85% English learners where I worked for 10 years. We built school gardens. We had an arts program, arts and music, and a, com a community garden and teacher professional development in this whole child approach where kids were in classrooms where their needs were met and where the need and teachers know the students by name, strength, and need, and whether that means more mental health counselors. At that school, we needed to build a school-based health center because there were physical needs. Kids were not going to well baby checks. They were not going to doctors until there was something wrong, and they were getting behind in their learning for something beyond what a teacher could solve. So a whole child approach at every school is one that allows students to have access to supports that are beyond what the teacher can just provide, and it's a community coming together. And I always will say, make sure you have arts and music as part of what you're doing because sometimes that's a way to unlock students' genius and passion. And the third principle that's critical to making any of this work is community partnership. As a principal that worked in an inner city school for 10 years, I couldn't what I had if it was not for the community partners. And that's why all of the work that we're doing at the department is bringing these three key principles together and putting work behind it. You, they, they sound great in theory. You can talk about these principles, but at the Department of Education, now we, we have initiatives that are bringing these three principles to life. The first one is the National Partnership for Student Success, and with that, we're bringing partners over 80 organizations from across the country. It's tied to the President's State of the Union speech where he called for action around bringing people, more people, more adults. Students need more meaningful and caring adults in their lives, not, not less. And so we're calling for 250,000 additional Americans to serve as academic tutors, mentors, student success coaches, children and youth, all for pre-kindergarten all the way through high school. And that's our national partnership for student success. We know students will have more trusted adults in their corners through this effort and through this uh, work that we're doing with so many different organizations. And I can say as a principal, it's great to have somebody help. Principals have enough to do to support the teachers and the students. When you have somebody that allows you to work together and bring the, bring the partners in, it makes the principal's job easier and it gives students access to more support and help. And then aligning with the national partnership with student success, which is more global, we also have the Engage Every Student initiative. And that is connected to our out-of-school time programming. We're seeing that students need more engagement with uh, the kinds of work that they do out of school. It's not just academic recovery. It's about learning and enrichment and joy and being able to work together and have access to really great programming out of school time. And there's great networks of organizations that do that. So that program shows districts and states how to use the American Rescue Plan to increase engaging every student in their out of school time. And then the last one that I love the most is, well, I'm not supposed to love one more than others, but I really love what we're doing about the Community Schools Grant Program because all of the work that I've ever seen that's successful is when you do something to a community or for a community, it never works. When you do it with a community, it always works. And the Community Schools Grant, you can see that the President Biden proposed an increase of $413 million to full service community schools. And that's where you see communities discovering what they care most about, just like I did with the Canyon Rim Literacy Center. At the time, I had to write a letter to a city council member to get $10,000 to just get this little literacy center started. But with community, community schools grants programs, you'll see more of that, more ideas coming from teachers who know what their kids need, know what the students want, and you can bring communities together. Making sure, my biggest advice I always say to people when you're trying to fix your local neighborhood school, make the answer come from inside. When you do something to somebody or for somebody, it disempowers and disenfranchises and takes away voice. The most powerful change is a change that happens with agency and passion. And sometimes it's not the things that are broken that you need to get in there and fix. Pay attention to what's working already in the school and help that grow and invest in that because there are people that need to see it to believe it. And when you create it, other people will build a model off of that. We will not be able to think our way 
into equity. We must act. We must act together with students at the center of every single decision. And there are plenty of examples where it's working. And on behalf of Secretary Cardona and the entire Department of Education, one in three of us at the department were classroom teachers. We are bringing classroom teacher experience to pushing policy forward that will help our students achieve and grow and meet their full potential and live their best lives. And I'm grateful to this organization for your convening. Thank you so much. Editor at large of a new global digital publication called Semaphore, which none of you have heard about yet, <laughs> but you might know me as editor at large of The Hill, uh, where I've been at for a few years. And I'm a contributing editor. And we're with uh, Arnie Duncan, uh, who, of course, is the ninth Secretary of Education. Uh, he is also a managing director of the Emerson Collective. That means uh, Lorene Powell Jobs, for you who might not know uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and that <laughs> role, which we get to. Uh, but I think more importantly, in, in some ways, for this conversation, which we'll get into, he's the founder in Chicago of something called Chicago Cred. And I want to get into that in a moment. I also want to say, I'm sorry all of you guys are in ties. I have the <laughs> privilege of uh, meeting and uh, knowing uh, President Reagan in his latter years. My mentor was one of his regular golf buddies. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he was very much a coat and tie guy, except on ranch day. So I consider this a ranch day. Uh, and I think Arnie does too. Um, Secretary Duncan, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And we've been through this before. Um, I also, just real quick, who are the students in this room? OK. Yeah. You're going to come up with a question to ask. OK, you ready? Uh, keep your hand up for a second. Who else? Who else? We got, we got a few. You got a question for me at the end, all right? So get ready. Get, you think in advance. And I may go to some more of you. I mean, you know, I like to get a little envy and jealousy going if it animates you. Uh, but I want to make sure that we get some uh, students in, into this. Um, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you, you know, I, I can't start a conversation about education in America, you know, particularly young people in schools, without talking about what we see as an epidemic of uh, crime, harm. You know, students are trying to move forward. Their parents are trying to move, move them forward in a high trust environment. And we have people that are very connected on a track, but it's a high fear environment. Tell us what you're doing with Chicago Cred, um, where you're trying to give young people agency in their education to begin dealing with some of this issue of violence in schools. Yes, yeah, so we're starting on a top, tough topic, but it's a... It's Welcome a, to my world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's real. So um, before I came to D.C., I ran the Chicago Public Schools for seven and a half years, and lots of things I'm proud about. We can have another conversation another day about higher graduation rates and more kids going to college and higher test scores and better teachers coming in. But on my watch, during my seven and a half years, on average, we had one of our students killed every two weeks due to gun violence. It was a staggering rate of loss. Never, thank goodness, in one of our schools, but walking home at the corner store on the bus going home and I don't think I know that we failed to keep our children safe uh, in the city. Um, coming to DC I thought things couldn't get any worse back home but for a whole host of reasons things got a lot worse. Fast forward to the time here and this is this is not news we've talked about this uh, you know President Obama dealt with the hardest issues on the planet that's what a president does um, his worst day in office was the day of the Sandy Hook massacre. Right. And he went down the next day. At that point, Vice President Biden, now President Biden, he and I went down two or three days later. And that was obviously a day I'll never forget. And my wife and I had two young children and see you know, 20 babies and five teachers. We went to the funeral of the principal. And again, lots I'm proud about of our work here in D.C. <laughs> but for me, one of our biggest failures is we got nothing done in terms of you know, gun legislation, making our kids safer. And I got close to some of those families, got close to some of the Parkland families. One of the moms from Sandy Hook actually came like six weeks ago to talk to the men I'm working with in Chicago. And it was amazing, you know, white woman from, from suburban Connecticut, all black men from Southside Chicago, unfortunately how much they have in common. Mm. So I just, to, to our young people here, I just honestly just apologize. I'm just so sorry. It, it's, it's, we're crazy, not to go on too long, but my, I, I played basketball for four years in Australia. My wife's Australian. In 1996, we just, we moved back here. They had a massacre in her, her home state of Tasmania, like 35 people killed. Within three weeks, they changed all the gun laws in Australia, changed everything. And for 20 years, 20 years in Australia, there was not a single mass shooting, not one. So that was the gift their politicians gave to your generation was not a mass shooting. And now, obviously, it's, it's everywhere. And schools 
you know, schools, ball games, parks, museums, concerts. Schools are part and they're fabric of our society, the fabric of our community. They're not separate. And so if our society is not safe, um, our schools can't be safe. And it just, it breaks my heart. This is not finding a cure for cancer, and this is not putting a man on Mars. We know what to do, and we've lacked the courage. We had a bill recently mm -hmm. that, that passed, and I was, they were nice enough to invite me to come to the White House, and that was the first time in 25, 30 years. We've had some momentum in the right direction, but it's a long way to go. Yeah, well, let me um, thank you for that, and it's such an important punctuation point to start the conversation. But I, and again, thinking about the students in the room, and, and again, if I were to ask this entire room, if you had a prof, you know, teacher, a professor, you know, a guidance counselor, someone in your in, you know, academic experience as you're growing up that was really important, who made a major dent uh, in, in the direction you chose, I bet, I bet almost all of you, there might be a few of you who had a miserable experience, miserable experience didn't get that affirmation or choice or support. Uh, and so we have to acknowledge that that's out there too. But as I think about it, and you're, you know, I'm going to overstate some things for effect. I kind of look at the education system as a system with a chronic disease. Hmm. And, and that while you get moments where things are well, what do you do if you have a chronic disease and you know, how do you treat it? And, and I think part of the question is, and if you think if you had diabetes or you, ha you were dealing with cancer, which has become more manageable, you know, I see some people who learn everything they can about that ailment and that try to become powerful despite their problem. And I see other people who become victims in the process, told what to do, don't have the same literacy others might have, you know, in dealing with their health challenges. I think that was, you know, my own mother's, you know, challenge to be candidly. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested, Arnie, you know, as you talk to young people, uh, a lot of people watching today, how do they gain agency? How do they become the opposite of victims yeah. wow. if they're in bad circumstances? How can they, because a lot of what you do in the Department of Education is trying to figure out how you get people to begin looking beyond the equation of what resource, how, to, how they get in and become responsible for a good track as opposed to victims of neglect and lack of resources? No, that's a great, important question. And I'll say for the young people in a room like this, I was never in a room like this in high school or college, so you guys are way far, way ahead of where I was. And there are a lot of people online yeah, watching too Yeah, exactly. Right so it's a, different, it's a different world. I'll just say a couple things. First of all, do not underestimate your power. <laughs> Please know. <laughs> We need your voice now and you know, try and study movements, whether it's a civil rights movement or protesting Vietnam War, whatever it might be, fighting for, for the rights of, of you know, LGBT, uh, LGBT community. That's all led by young people. That's not, those are led by 16, 17, 18 year olds. And I'll just, we can talk about a lot of issues, but I'll focus on education specifically, because that's why we're here. If we had more young people demanding access to AP classes and demanding access to better technology and demanding access to better after school programs and making sure that you're going to high school that wasn't a dropout factory. We as adults need that pressure. And the, the critique of me both in Chicago and here, and there's truth to it, is that I went too fast. And there is some truth. My honest self-reflection is that we move too slow, that education moves at a glacial speed. And you guys have one chance for an education. And obviously, the world's changed. The economy's changed. If you drop out of high school today, you're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. There are no good jobs for you. Mm -hmm. If you just have a high school diploma, there are almost no good jobs. So some form of education, two-year, four-year trade, technical vocational training, some form of education has to be the goal for every single young person in our country. And again, this is a privileged room. The majority of Americans don't go to college. I don't know if folks here realize that. The majority of Americans do not go to college. So I worry about a caste system based a little bit on race, but really based around educational opportunity. I worry about the haves and the have-nots. I worry about our democracy fraying, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that now because people feel locked out and, and scared. And obviously, I'm pretty, I think education is the one thing that can create upper mobility. And so having young people fight for these things and challenge us and ask for more and you know, in Chicago, I never had young people saying, your high school graduation rate isn't getting better fast enough. Like, what else are you going to do? Like, I, you know, we need that pressure. And know your voice, know your power, think, vote, but be, be active, be active. We need that pressure. You know, today's uh, forum, I think it's called the, uh, the, the Quest for Connectivity. I look at it as human connectivity. We're supposed to be connecting the dots. Yeah. And one of the things I'm interested in is technology. And you know, I saw Korea when I, I'm older than a lot of you folks. I may be older. I have no idea. Maybe we're the same age. I think I may, may have a year on you. But you know, when you saw South Korea in in the 1970s, it was one of the most poor one of the most poor places in the world. 
You see it today, it, it leapfrogged uh, to extraordinary status in the world. Uh, it is the leading semiconductor uh, manufacturer along with Taiwan, and it just, it's just an, an incredible hub of talent, of trained people. It's a completely different universe in the world. And so I've always looked at what can technology do for American education to help us in some places, leapfrog out of a crappy situation yeah. into something much more impressive. And are we and are we deploying technology in a way that allows us to do that? Well, the pandemic forced our hand, mm. <laughs> and we caught up <laughs> very rapidly. There was a massive digital divide. That divide is almost pretty much closed now, which is great. But one of the just the amazing honors of working here was traveling to 50 states, urban, rural, suburban. Native American reservations, which I had never done before. And the idea, obviously, of technology of a, a young person learning anything they want, anytime, 24-7. So if you don't have access to AP bi biology or to physics or to you know, advanced trigger, whatever, having the chance to, to learn those things yourself, um, it's still harder than it should be, hmm. but I think it, it, it can be a game changer. And so the idea historically was that your learning was confined to a physical building. <laughs> Nine, nine to three, five days a week, nine months a year, and the fact that you guys can pursue your passions, pursue your interests, do anything you want, anytime, um, it's still not equal, but it has a chance to be an equalizer, and I think that's an amazing thing. You know, sometimes when I do education forums, I've had people that were advocates of charter schools, presidents of teachers' unions on the same stage, and I shocked them one day, and I said, hey, why don't you stand up, change seats, and argue the best points of your of, of the alternative side. And we were going to have uh, former Deputy Secretary Bill Hansen with us, who worked for Republican administration. Of course, Secretary Duncan worked for Democratic administration. And I'm just sort of interested in you know that introspective thought process of what did the Republicans get right in the education space. And and I would also say you can reflect on what. President Obama got right, but also what were some of the blind spots there as you tried to transform education? Yeah, and I'll answer that directly, but I'll first say that the reason I, I try and come to this event religiously is I think education has to be the ultimate bipartisan or nonpartisan issue. There's nothing for me. Here, here. You know, more kids access to high quality pre-K, more kids reading, higher graduation rates, more kids going to college, leading the world in college completion, which we mm -hmm. did a generation ago, we're now 12th, so a lot of other countries are 16th. A lot of other countries being us. So for me, there's nothing left or right, or Republican or Democrat, about any of this stuff. Yeah. And I think they're good ideas on every side. They're bad ideas on every side. Um, I try to work extraordinarily closely with my Republican colleagues because that's how you get things done. But because mm -hmm. it's that important, I probably got more heat from the left than I did from the right on some days, and that was that was okay. You were the Joe Manchin back then. <laughs> Joe's a friend, and uh, I, I will tell you, Joe's Joe's interesting. Not to. <laughs> We differ on some things, <laughs> but I spent time in West Virginia, in Appalachia, and I had never seen white poverty before. I grew mm -hmm. up with sort of black poverty, and seeing the decimation of those families in those communities and folks that had been five generations in the coal mines and those jobs are gone, and that desperation. I will say that he understands his constituents <laughs> in a way that few do, and he listens. I'll just I'll just leave that there. Um, so. What did, let me try and answer directly. Yeah. What, did, what did folks get right uh, on the Republican side? And unfortunately, I'm just very honest, and maybe they won't invite me back, I don't know what the Republicans stand for education today. I just think they've lost, mm. uh, lost their way. Historically, you had folks like Jeb Bush and other folks who wanted high standards and wanted to make sure that if folks were graduating from high school, they were actually ready to go to college. Mm -hmm. And that's, for me, that's the, the killer. People, we talk about the high cost of college, and that's real. What we don't talk about is we spend about $9 billion a year for high school graduates to take remedial classes in college because they're actually not prepared. And so that's, those are the kinds of things that I think Republicans did, did right. You know, we can, I think we did you know, a lot of things right as well, but it, for me it's not about left or right or who did whatever. I'll give you a great example. We, talked, we didn't get it done. We talked a lot about free community college. That For me, the K-12 is insufficient today. It's got to be a pre-K to 14 system. We've got to get our babies ready. As I said earlier, you have to, you have, to um, have some form of education beyond high school. So we talked about it, bully pulpit it. We didn't get that done. Who got it done? It was uh, Bill Haslam in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Bill Haslam's a Republican governor. He's a good friend. He took it and ran. I guess he probably thought it was politically 
you know, helpful maybe, right. but he saw it as the best investment in his human capital, which is the best thing in any state. And so that's just an example of you know, folks working together, getting it done. Supposedly that's a, Repu uh, that's a Democratic idea, but the guy who executed and implemented it was a Republican governor. Look, we have a you know kind of continuity, and we should be thinking of this of what we're doing in pre-K and you know kindergarten. You kind of work through the the grades, and then going off uh, to community college or various forms of other training or colleges. And in in in, in my frank opinion, we have a winner-takes-all kind of approach where people chase uh, at elite you know Ivy school you know Ivy League universities, very very expensive education. We can debate whether it ends up being good or not. Yeah. But a lot of other people in the process are demeaned. Yeah, yeah. There's stigma if you don't go a certain way. Um, and I'm just interested in how in the hell we can <laughs> disrupt that negative stigma yeah. that it's good and fair and right that we get other credentialing and that other people can other choices. And, and, and what do we do when we talk about affordability? It's not just affordability, but how do we broaden the aperture yeah. so that people can realize they can live fantastic lives making any number of choices? I'd just love to know how to dismantle that. These are great questions. Uh, I, I don't have a great answer. I'll but you're just say, at Emerson Collective, yeah, and you yeah. should. <laughs> figure, figure it out. So I'll just say it's fascinating. You guys know this. Historically, forever, colleges' prestige was based upon what? It was based upon how many they excluded. Hmm. The higher percent that you excluded, the more prestigious you were. And it's, it's all backwards. It's all backwards. So prestige, recognition, who we reward, should be based on not how many we exclude, but how many we include. And obviously with technology now, as you know, universities can serve not just the you know, physical folks on a campus, but they can serve hundreds of thousands, and some are, in really democratizing access to college. The goal for me is never just access to college, it's completion. Mm -hmm. And so for me, again, we talk about college costs. The worst possible scenario is you have debt but no degree. Right. If you get your degree, odds are very high you're going to be able to pay back those loans. If you don't have that degree, you're in a worse situation. So how we evaluate universities, how we rank them, how we reward them, how we shine a spotlight on them, I want it based upon access, <laughs> inclusion, not exclusion, and then based upon completion rates. So if you just open the door but aren't, don't have in place systems to help first-generation college goers you know, graduate or English language learners or immigrants or whatever, then again, you're actually putting them in a worse situation. So that has to fundamentally change. And then obviously, the world of work, you guys are going to go into jobs that we don't even know what they are. They don't, they don't even exist mm -hmm. today. But how we train you to, to think, to ask questions, to write, to be part of a team, those are the skills you're going to need anywhere. And so just to your point, be much more open-minded about the range of um, opportunities out there. And we're sort of talking higher ed, but if you've paid a plumber lately, like I have, or you've paid an auto mechanic lately, like I did last week, they're making pretty darn good livings. And so for me, there's no, I never want to assign other countries your college track or your career track at 13 or 14. I, never, I just want to give young people great, great options and let them figure out what their passion is and you know, what, what they would love to do the rest of their life. And if we do that, then I think we'll be in a much better place. Um, I want to ask you just perhaps one more question, then I'm going to go to our students. So I, are you ready? Are you, are you ready? <laughs> no, no pressure. Okay, no pressure. Ready. So um, I guess the other area is, is the observation I've had in education is that we have a, a very, very fragmented education system. And, and you, you were sort of the head of it, and you sort of weren't, <laughs> right? So um, Secretary of Education sounds great. But you didn't have a lot of control over what happened to local school board you know, areas. You've got you know, localities. You've got states. Uh, you've, of course, got federal levels of, of investment. And I'm just interested. I sort of feel like if somebody is uh, passionate about something and you know, they're at a local level, they w may want their passion to become a national standard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you're at that level and you feel like the national standard is wrong, you want to focus on you know, your local rights yeah. to control and direct your education. I'd just be interested if you have any insights on how we can improve how we get to a right good equilibrium where there's give and take. Because right now, I think it is, continues to be a broken system yeah. where a lot of people look at the Department of Education for a lot of answers it can never solve. And that yet lo localities, in with what they're struggling with in whichever way they have, are, are you know, often islands. So. Yeah. 
So I think I have two good answers, but I've been a failure at executing on these answers. Okay. So I need, need your it's guys. About you, you, you can come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Need your guys help. Need you guys help on this. So the first thing, I sort of started with it. Let me just put out a couple things. What if our goal was to lead the world in access to high quality pre-K? Hmm. What if our goal, our graduation rates, we got them up to historic highs. I'm a little dated, you know, 86, 87 percent, but still a long way to go. What if the goal for the country was to get that to 90 percent? What if the goal was to make, a, make sure 100% of those 90% were actually college and career ready, didn't have to take remedial classes? Mm -hmm. What if our goal was to lead the country, lead the, sorry, lead the world, lead the planet in college graduation rates? Because in a flat world, high tech jobs, skilled jobs are <coughs> where the best educated workforce is. And that's going to be the United States, or it's going to be Singapore, or South Korea, or India, or wherever. So for me, again, those couple goals there. None of those are left or right goals. And if we as a nation could agree to those goals, and if they stood the test of time across administrations, and we'll all have different strategies to achieve those goals, but we never sort of talk about the big goals. So that would be the first thing I'd just challenge all of us to think about is can we as a nation unite behind some goals? And we'll come at it from different ways, and that's great. It should be what works in Montana is very different than works in inner city, inner city Chicago or in you know, some other place. So unite behind goals, have lots of flexibility around strategies, but hold ourselves accountable for getting there. That would be my first. Mm -hmm. The second one, and it's just so important for folks to understand, I don't, it's easy to blame politicians for our, for our problems, and there's, they deserve some, some blame, but my honest observation is that the vast majority of politicians are followers. They're not leaders. And the truth is, again, left or right, Republican, Democrat, almost no one votes on education. No one votes on education. And if we held our mayors, our congressmen, our senators, our governors, our presidents, if we held them accountable for those metrics I talked about, more kids having access to pre-K, higher graduation rates, more young people going to college, then the country wins. The country wins. But none of us, we all say we care about education, but in the midterms, I actually checked it, 6% of people voted with education in mind, 6%. So I've never met a politician that's mm. anti-education. They all wanted to go visit schools with me and do photo ops and you know, read a book to a kid. But how many were willing to hold themselves accountable? How many were willing to invest? And so those two, those two things, having a set of national goals that we could have lots of different strategies to achieve them. And if folks, if all of you voted at every election thinking about what is this person committed to doing and holding them accountable to keep their job or lose their job based upon increasing opportunities, that would change the world. Last quick story, South Korea. Uh, very, very highly educated. Maybe some people say they pushed too hard. But there, President Obama asked the President of South Korea, what's your biggest challenge? And the President of South Korea said, my biggest challenge right away is that my parents are too demanding. <laughs> and that my parents of my, you know, whatever it was, first or second grade, even my poorest parents are demanding my kids learn, they, their kids learn English. And you always sort of had that uncomfortable laugh you heard today, because we don't have any of those demands here. Right we got to be a lot more demanding of all of us. Well, look, you know, all of you, um, I'm going to go to the, uh, our students. We'll try and get as many in the minutes we have left. I'll tell you, it's such a privilege for me to be up with Secretary Duncan. We've had a chance to do this before. Uh, these are all new questions. I've never asked them before. Um, I'd love to talk to him about, you know, should we ban books in you know, uh, uh, schools? Should we, what does it take no, today no. You know, <laughs> to, to, uh, to evolve, uh, to evolve and, and, and think about what it is to teach American civics or about yeah, civitas? Yeah. A lot of key questions I don't have time to get to, but I do want to get to all of you. But I want you watching to realize this is a great innovator and thinker about education. And I have a zillion questions to ask him, but I'm going to go to you now. So let's go to this gentleman right here. Uh, you ready? Got a OK, she's going to bring a microphone to you. Uh, tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Christian Cardona, not related to the Secretary of Education, <laughs> although we both do You're love education. You're disassociating yourself that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from D.C., okay. so home. And my question is, how do you sort of reconfigure education uh, away from it being like a regurgitation of talking points hmm. and sort of focusing more on, you know, wanting people to uh, love education because they want to learn new things and to focus on critical thinking? Or do you have to change messaging and, you know, stay away from uh, what they have now into trying to get people away from, uh, you know, the, what, like, for example, the things that happened in Chicago and uh, how that sort of <coughs> hurt them and how they can view education as an escape. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So f 
First of all, he's part of, there's a group here from the Mikva Challenge, which I just have to give them a quick shout out. I'm just a huge fan. Um, when I ran Chicago Public Schools, I had a student advisory council of high school students that was put together by the Mikva Challenge. And uh, remarkable young people, and all of my policy stuff I did in Chicago, I would run by them. And sometimes I have a good idea, and sometimes I have a crazy idea, and they were very, very clear. So extraordinarily helpful. I know there's a program here in D.C. as well. So whatever I can do to help Nick, but I want to keep doing it. It's having you guys engaged in, in democracy is huge. So obviously, you know, the, the Internet, and it's changed the world. You, you, you probably, like I grew up memorizing a lot of dates and a, a lot of rivers and a lot of continents, and it's important to know some of that, but you can Google most of that these days. And so you hit, and I tried to say it for me, what are the skills that all of you need you need to be able to think critically. And there's so much misinformation. Dis disinformation is actually even a different level of that. Mm -hmm. How do you sort through that? How do you express yourself verbally and on paper? Um, how do you become a lifelong learner? The day he stops learning, the day I stop learning, we're obsolete. It doesn't matter what we've done. We have, until the day we die, we got to be, the world's changing. We have to keep learning. He started a new business. I started a new thing. You have to keep challenging yourselves. Um, how do you work as part of a team? Um, Domestically, internationally, obviously the world shrunk so much. For me, those are the skills, regardless of whatever you guys are going to do the rest of your lives, those are the skills you're going to need. And so that's the kind of thing we have to start doing. It's just interesting. When I was in high school, if somebody helped you on a paper, that was cheating. Like that was literally, like <laughs> you couldn't do that. My daughter, who's a sophomore in college, rising junior, some of you guys' ages, she's in high school college. She and her friends are all helping each other write their papers. It's fascinating. They're sharing. They're going back and forth. And that's encouraged. And it's just a totally different way to learn. It's not a solo way. It's a, it's a, it's a team game. And they're making each other better. And so those are the kind of skills that I think we need to, do. We need to sort of be teaching you guys and having, having teachers, having principals, having schools that don't lecture at you all day but allow you to do projects and explore and, and work together. I think for the vast majority of young people, that's going to be pretty motivating. It's a great question, Christian. Now, right here, this, this lady right here, third row. What's your name and where are you from? I'm Kira Canada, and I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. And my question is, how do students find do a voice? Do you meet all the presidential candidates when they come through? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> Maybe you know you're in the right street corner in coffee shops to yeah. do that. So. so my question is, how do students find a voice in changing policies and getting in the room or the conversation without being just a prop. And yeah. it kind of goes towards um, how you said, like, you had a committee that Supervisor helped you make. Council. Yeah, 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 and, like, yeah. I've never, ever seen that in <laughs> my state or city in particular. So yeah. clearly I see it's happened, but yeah. how do students say, how do I get in that conversation? Yeah, and I think it's a good point just not to be the token. And make it really good when you ask, because I want her to take this back to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. Iowa and yeah. show it, you know. Yeah, so, so I'll try and be very you know, concrete and granular. So whether it's at the school level, you know, high school, middle school, you guys are so smart. You guys know what's working and what's not. And so if I was a principal of a middle school or principal of a high school, I gotta be listening to my, my, my young people. I have to, and they're gonna tell me the truth. <laughs> and you guys don't filter much. And sometimes the truth is a little hard to hear, but we need to hear it. And so I, to, for you, very directly to go back, I don't know who your superintendent is there um, in your city, but every superintendent needs to have 10, 15 young people who he's meeting with on a monthly basis just thinking things through. And the kinds of decisions and the kinds of things where, you know, we had a $5 billion budget. We're trying to, you know, figure out policy. And again, there are times when I thought I had a brilliant idea and my students would say, that's, that's not real. That's not going to work. And that would, I mean, I can't tell you how helpful it was to hear that. And so for me, it's not like being altruistic. It's really out of self-interest. They may be better. They may be better. And so um, as long as you're willing, you know, we all like to talk. <laughs> I think the best leaders like to listen more than they talk. And so I would encourage you guys going home wherever, your high schools, your middle schools, even your elementary schools, but definitely your districts, they need a student advisory council. And it's got to be sort of a permanent fixture. It's not just a one. You don't just meet one time and say, I talk to some students. It's every month, every other month. And we would just go, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm struggling with. We'd just go, what are, what are you guys thinking about? What are you guys here? And obviously, I had 600 schools. I had 100 high schools. I, could, I tried to be everywhere. You can't be everywhere. You need, you need that input. You need that input. So that would be my concrete recommendation. I'd also say if you end up finding yourself a prop, sometimes props 
have a kind of power and leverage that moment. I mean, I, I, you know, I really uh, heard that language, and, and, it, and it is a, you can kind of feel demeaned and left behind, you know, as you're sort of being celebrated by someone in their chess game. But, you know, you can also kind of begin to turn that around that moment uh, and, and bring it around and have it. We've got time for maybe 15 seconds. One last question. I'm going to use every moment. Yes, sir, right here. We have Carlos. Uh, make it quick, Carlos. <laughs> Uh, first I want to know your name, but don't tell me where you're from. No, go ahead, tell me where you're from. <laughs> first and foremost, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. My name is Carlos Pareja, and I'm a student at the University of California, Berkeley, where first generation and low-income students are a minority. Uh, yeah. You know, fighting for education is necessary so our marginalized and low-income communities can move up the social ladder. Yeah. But when financial issues, whether it's family responsibilities or a lack of social capital or a lack of institutional knowledge become an issue, Mr. Secretary, how can we as students put pressure and mobilize so our <laughs> elected officials can see us hear us and empathize with our financial demands and our lack of understanding of the higher education system in our country, especially when every issue in this country seems to be gridlocked by perpetual hyperpolarization for our elected officials and you know those who we put our trust in to carry out the policy that will change our lives. Yeah, that's a great way to end. Let me, I'll get to the political part. For me, the best thing, and obviously somehow you navigated that. I don't know who helped or how you did it, but for me, you can't be the exception. You gotta be the norm. And so I would just encourage, you may already be doing this with your friends, you gotta go back to your high school. You gotta go back and talk. And they can hear from folks like me or folks like him. They need to hear from someone like you. And what's working, what's not, how do you do that? And that peer-to-peer -peer or near-peer mentorship, um, don't underestimate how much you can inspire. So with all your, your friends who are in college, go back and tell, the, you know, tell them the truth. You know, this worked, I struggled here, I had success here, I failed here. I can't tell you how this, those personal connections, how important that is. I would just go back to the other point that all of you guys, again, I don't care, Republican, I truly don't care. Think when you vote, who's increasing funding for our higher education? Who's making sure that high schools are rigorous enough so that folks can go there and take you know, real classes? Um, who sees education as an investment, not an expense? I always want to be clear, we have to be held accountable for results, but education is the best, it's not, it's the best, it's, it's the only investment we can make, as you said, to, to, right. to build a more equitable society and have some upper mobility. The fine, I'll be a little edgy on this last thing, and I've thought about this a lot in the context of the, of the gun violence, and people don't like when I say this, but I'll say it. If, what if young people walked out of schools and tell politicians made schools safe, made the community safe? Like there's real, you think about boycotts, you think about sit-ins, you look at our history. Um, we have dealt you guys a devastating hand, a hand that's absolutely unfair. And a little more <laughs> radical pushback against that. I'll even do my, you know, what if young people at a high school that didn't have AP classes, what if they boycotted that school? I guarantee you, they'd get some AP classes pretty quick. Yeah. So folks don't love when I say that, but you can hear a little bit of emotion in my voice. Don't underestimate your power. I would just like to say what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you and that sometimes, you know, when you go to a conference, you're, you're learning, and particularly the young people here, the best conversations are uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Mr. Yeah. Secretary. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for having me.